Now, the COVID-19 pandemic may have changed the way people behave and live their lives, perhaps forever. How do sudden changes affect an investor's outlook? Rebecca Martin from Monetary Authority of Singapore will aim to find out through her panel of investors. Joining her are Eduardo Severin, co-founder and partner of B Capital Group Singapore, Dr. Tilman Ebrek, uh, managing partner at Flourish Ventures, and Subra S. Ayer, co-founder and chief executive officer of Moxtra. Let's go to Rebecca now to hear the priorities of investors for the upcoming year. Welcome to the best session of the day, everybody. I'm joined by three incredible entrepreneurs and investors that will share their personal journeys and the way they're approaching 2021. My first victim is Tillman, the managing partner of Flourish Ventures. Flourish is the financial inclusion investment arm of Amidia Network, which was set up by the founder of eBay, um, Pierre Amidia. Having worked and invested across Asia and Africa, Tillman also serves as an advisory council member on the, of the UN on inclusive finance for development. My next victim is Eduardo, the co-founder and first investor in Facebook. Eduardo more recently co-founded the B2B-focused investment fund, B Capital. And what do Tillman and Eduardo have in common? Well, they both owe their, uh, their full careers to the founder of eBay, um, Pierre. And why is that? Eduardo told us before this session that the first... Um, class he ever took of real value at Harvard was one on a case study of um, eBay. So we have Eduardo's career to thank to, to eBay there. And my final victim of the day um, is Subra, certainly last um, but not least at all, the co-founder and former CEO of WebEx. Subra then went on to invest in Zoom and is now back in the game with his new startup, Moxtra. So welcome and thank you for joining me today. I'd like thank to start you. this session with a quick fire round um, of overrated and underrated. So I'm going to ask each of you some buzzwords, um, of technology buzzwords or industry um, segments that I'd like you to answer your, your overrated or underrated to. So just one word answers, please, and I'll start with something easy. So the first is artificial intelligence. Overrated or underrated? I'll start with you, Tillman. Uh, underrated. Underrated. Eduardo? Underrated. You agree, Subra? Yes. Um, I'm sort of, um, I would say it's middle. <laughs> <laughs> Sitting on the fence, guys. <laughs> All right. No, no I, I think it is uh, relatively, you know, its applications are in certain areas, not exactly in the areas that today it's focused on, but I think, yeah, so I, you know, it's a balanced approach, I would agree. So it's All a right. nuanced answer. So you're all relatively bullish on AI. Um, all right, next one, challenger banks. Eduardo, you first. I think it's underrated as well. You're all nodding. Do you all agree? Underrated? Uh, it depends on the geography. Underrated in the US, overrated in Europe, conceivably. I can talk more about that later. You're biased, though, Tillman. I know you're an investor in Chime. Um, Subra, <clears throat> do you agree? I agree. It's underrated. Underrated. All right. Working from home. Subra, you first. Overrated or underrated? Emotionally, massively overrated. <laughs> <laughs> Eduardo? Um, probably overrated. Overrated. It's been a long time now. Subra? <laughs> I would say underrated. Oh, OK, all right. A bit of diversion now in the panel. Um, and I, I actually moderated a session earlier this week with David Marcus. So I have to ask, Diem, the rebrand of Libra, overrated or underrated? Eduardo, I'm going to start with you. The rebranding, um, uh, uh, hard to answer. I'll, I'll be in the middle if possible. Fair enough. Diplomatic answer. Tillman? Uh, I say underrated, and I can also explain why later. <clears throat> Great. I, I didn't understand the question, sorry. Overrated or underrated Libra, which has recently rebranded to Diem? No opinion, actually. I don't okay. have an opinion. <laughs> Next one is, uh, which is more in your wheelhouse, Subra, video conferencing software. Overrated or underrated? <laughs> Very nuanced. Uh, hmm. Currently overrated, but it's not really its potential. Right? So, you know, again, my answers are very nuanced, right? Uh, uh, you know, short term, overrated, long term, underrated. How about that? Nice. Eduardo? Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. Uh, video conferencing software, overrated or underrated? 
uh, we need to, it, it's a hard one to answer. I think it would be important in what we do. So it's from that standpoint, there's an underrated element to it. But in its current form, uh, it could be overrated. Similar to Subra, so maybe short term, long term, there's a different view. Tillman? Yep. Yeah, I'd also say underrated. All right, OK, a bit of agreement here. Um, all right, now that we've got started, I'll move into the panel. Can you hear me OK, Eduardo? Um, I can. Good. Yep. All right, you're with us. Um, I'd like to start with you and, and look at the investment priorities for 2021. So uh, what are you seeing as the biggest opportunities and how will you be framing in, in priorities for B Capital? Absolutely. I mean, this has been a, an incredible year, both in, uh, in, in for the world overall. Uh, it's, it's, it's humbled us by, by what something like a global pandemic can do to us as a society, as a civilization. But when you think about it from an investment standpoint, especially investors that are looking at uh, the tech enablement of the world, it's been an incredible acceleration uh, engine for the enablement of uh, uh, technology to be core to very traditional industries that I would say were intrinsically hesitant by their design structures or regulation. So when we think about uh, what uh, this pandemic and, and generally where the world is, is leading towards, we see a lot of areas and verticals to invest in. For financial services, this idea of financial inclusion uh, has become increasingly more important, not just in developing countries where we may have over 1.5 billion or more people that don't have access to, to services, but even in developed markets where SMEs, uh, frankly, don't have equivalent access to to credit as uh, as you would in very large businesses. We've also seen and, and deeply invest in healthcare. And this idea of accelerating innovation in healthcare, both from the perspective of how services are rendered uh, digitally, uh, telemedicine is, is, is critically important, all the way to how do you accelerate the pace of innovation from the discovery of drugs. So, so there's a lot of areas to be investable. But as all this gets done, as you get sort of digitization to be a big part of traditional industries, you also have to look at how to secure it. So the underlyings of smart enterprise, and in particular in this case, cybersecurity, will be critically important. So cyber is a big trend for you and really focusing on financial inclusion and health there. Um, and Tillman, I'd like to pick up on your fair finance principles at Flourish because there seems to be a lot of similarities to what Eduardo is saying. What are some of the areas of opportunity that you're seeing and perhaps some of the unforeseen challenges that we should expect in 2021? You know, I, I echo first what Eduardo said around the acceleration of what we believed would happen and we thought it might happen year, it might take years or decades. The, the pandemic and, and then in the, lock, the lockdowns really accelerated things dramatically. Uh, and uh, in that context, there sort of, I, I can sort of highlight three themes that, that we believe that already started in the second half of 2020, and they will continue into 2021. And they all have to do with the fact that we collectively, like the four of us right now, we live at and work from home. We try to make a, a, a living from home. People work, we, we shop online, we have family reunions online. So life has shifted online dramatically. And in that context, what becomes more important are the platforms that are important in our life. Uh, and that could be the me social media platforms, that could be the e-commerce platforms, that could be platforms that help me uh, uh, as a gig economy worker make money. Um, and so these platforms have become more important. And we have invested and we will continue to invest in platforms that actually help people uh, improve their lives. And these are, of course, sectoral or segmental smaller platforms. It's not the giants that already exist. But there's a lot of happening in that space, and I can give examples. We made four or five investments of that type over the last um, 12 months, very much backloaded. What then happens is they, these new platforms need to still connect with regulated entities and balance sheets at the back end, and somebody has to connect them. So there's a real push into in the B2B infrastructure 
world, so we invest there. And then there are these modules that plug into platforms that could be credit at the point of service or insurance at the point of service. So we see an acceleration there as well. And we believe all of that could do a lot of good, as Eduardo said, reaching people uh, for the first time with better services at far lower cost. But we do want this to be an open architecture type system where there are no new monopolies and where ultimately the financial system um, serves the real economy and people know what happens with their data and, uh, and uh, where the competition is on the basis of superior value propositions and trust and not uh, some sort of unfair advantage. Picking up on that point around superior value propositions, Subra, your domain expertise is really in collaboration software. Uh, so you've yeah. doubled down in this space time and time again, you know, founding WebEx, investing in Zoom, now starting and founding again in Mokstra. Uh, how has the pandemic affected your strategy at Mokstra and what new needs are you uh, seeing emerging? Yeah. yeah, as you said, my domain knowledge is in collaboration and the Mokstra is sort of the uh, third generation of people from WebEx, believe it or not. Uh, and this is around mobile, you know, mobile extra, right? And the word extra comes from the extra price, the idea of uh, the enterprise moving to the extra price. And I think I would echo on uh, what the other panelists talked about, right, Eduardo and Tillman, which is it's about removing, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of friction that was there. Uh, and it's a lot of it was cultural friction, right? Many of these things we talked about 20 years ago about, I imagine that uh, work would come to people and so people going to work. It didn't happen for 20 years, <laughs> but it happened overnight. Now, I'm not happy it happened in these circumstances, but, uh, you know, I've always been, my foray into collaboration started because I've been very, very jealous of my time. And I think my time belongs to me. And the time I used to spend on commute traffic and uh, was, I thought, was a tremendous waste of time, to be honest with you. I, of course, I don't like the current situation, like the choice of going where I want to go when I want to go. But the cultural change, that has happened is dramatic. Where I see it affect from our domain is, is, is particularly the companies having to, it's not just working from home, your employees, but your customers are working from home. So you can't just drop in and visit your customer for a cup of coffee whenever you want. So how do you keep your customers close? And so I believe we're seeing a lot of changes where Companies will have to adapt, and new companies are born with the customer at the center. People always talk about customer-centric organizations, but most workflows, because of historical reasons, have not been developed in that form. Uh, but new organization to work, your customers working from home. Your customers going to choose not to be, so you can pop in and be. So how do you build a long-lasting uh, customer relationship? And particularly where your customer can reach into your organization, and we take the examples of Uber and DoorDash, and these are all companies started with first an app that their customer used and built the entire company around that app. And we, you know, so we believe it's a huge opportunity to democratize that uh, philosophy across uh, into B2B and other areas where, again, it's truly the extra price with the customer at the center. So that's sort of the high level trend that I do see. I think Tillman described it earlier as a shot in the arm um, for, for Subra there. The, the pandemic has caused a, a huge increase in, in demand for this kind of customer-centric offering. Tillman, it feels like a good time to, to come back to your Challenger Bank point earlier, that the US is underrated um, and there's lots of opportunities there, and perhaps echoing what Subra said about the focus on customer centricity. Yeah, so... Um there is, challenger banks can do a lot of good, right? So it's a bank on an app, there's no branch system, there's no legacy IT infrastructure, no silos to contend with. So we, we were really, very bullish on challenger banks four or five years ago and, and invested pretty heavily across the globe. Um, what works well in the US is the fact that the debit card interchange fee is pretty high and so you can pay for the platform on the basis of that, and then everything else that you can do for your customers is, is sort of just icing on the top of the cake. So there's a fundamental industry structure and industry economics sort of um, uh, 
configuration that, that makes the challenger banks in the US very, very powerful. And you did mention Shime already. They do phenomenally well, and they have done phenomenally well uh, before the pandemic, and they got accelerated. In other geographies, and that would include Southeast Asia, challenger bank is tougher, right? Because the underlying, the payment piece in of itself might not pay for that new bank and that new platform. And so you need to add in credit or you need to do other things. And so it's, it's a more challenging uh, environment. And therefore, right, my answer of whether it's overrated or underrated depends a little bit on the geography that I'm thinking about. Eduardo, I can see you nodding, nodding along to what Tillman's saying there. Would you say that's right, that for Southeast Asia, it's, um, it's a harder model to get right? Yeah, no, certainly it's, it's, it's a big challenge. And, and, and there's a question that I have generally on what a challenger bank means, uh, because there's been sort of this, this uh, progress towards the unbundling of, of what a bank does to point solutions. And now there's been maybe a, a reversion to a digital first bundling back of those solutions. But I think we're still sort of in this part of the world more into an unbundling and you have point solutions that are digital first. But what's really important in, in, in this part of the world is the vast majority, I meaning if you go to places like Indonesia, are either unbanked or underbanked. So, so the question is, how do we get financial inclusion into the majority of the population? So it's less of a question of will a digital first entry challenge a bank, but I think what would be best uh, uh, everywhere is if there's a way for existing institutions to also embrace this agile first uh, tech enabled uh, innovation philosophy, putting customers in the middle of what they do, enable a digitization that uh, lowers costs and enables them to lend more broadly new uh, forms of assessing credit. I think there's a lot of, of things that, that hopefully both incumbents in the ecosystem and new age challengers can come together to solve. Because I think ultimately in places like Southeast Asia, but frankly, in, in most parts of the world, uh, there would be a, a, a better process for, for that to actually ultimately reach and, 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 and capture uh, the attention and the day-to-day -day activities of the world. Uh, as an example, in this part of the world, we want to make sure you know, transfer fees are primarily borne by, by those that can't afford it. Uh, is there a way that we can make sure that the majority of, of cash being transferred country to country in the region isn't uh, ultimately done with those types of transaction fees? Hopefully everyone can get together both digital, challenger, and existing infrastructure and get that solved for, for the good of humanity, frankly. Were you overrated or underrated on Libra? Oh, you abstained from voting on that one, is that right? <laughs> I, I think it's, uh, you know, to speak broadly, I am, I am incredibly supportive of open architecture uh, to, to, to help rebuild the backbone of financial infrastructure. This idea of the SWIFT system and high transfer fees, I think it's something that has to go away. The same way, if you look sort of back in the day, SMSs were, were something very hard, expensive, it was sort of uh, limited to those that could pay for it and access it. Eventually, through time, technology players, uh, also uh, telcos that have lowered the cost of data, provided this ability of people to communicate online to be accessible to the world. Let's do the same thing to financial transactions and make it as quick, whether it's to DM or broadly, I'm supportive of the open infrastructure uh, as, as a format that will enable that to be done. I'd like to talk a bit about purpose and profit. Um, you've talked a lot about yeah. financial inclusion. Um, and I, I wonder if, do you think it is possible to invest for good and invest for profit at the same time? Uh, Tillman, over to you. Yeah, I do absolutely believe that, and we do that. But I, let me come back to, to, to Libra. Um, you know, it is, it is, it is relatively easy to think of incredibly powerful use cases that could happen in these big, big platforms. Uh, if you are a cab driver in New York and you are from Pakistan and you want to send money to your nieces and nephews back home in Karachi, uh, if you could do that on WhatsApp, because that's what you use anyhow to communicate, uh, that would be incredibly powerful, right? And to Eduardo's point earlier, 
international remittances on average still cost 7%. I mean, that's really a scandal, right? Um, and so you can think of very powerful use cases. And what the big platforms do is they have an installed user base. They have, um, uh, they, they, have they, they, they have very high engagement. And they can add these services at, at very low marginal cost. So that's, on one hand, very good news, right? In particular, from a financial inclusion perspective. You can really expand. And this would be true for e-commerce platforms or ride-hailing platforms, everybody. Uh, can expand access to finance, and that's a good thing. But there are also risks, right? There, there, there could be a concentration of market power. There are questions around data privacy and, 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 and agency. Um, from a regulatory perspective, there's a question of, hang on a second, if we regulate these guys differently from the financial institutions, does that lead to systemic risk? So I, I'm with Eduardo, and that's what really our fair finance principles are about, right? We want, we want a financial system that serves customers in the real economy, that is open architecture, that is well regulated because we need people to have trust. Ultimately, people need to be better off because of these innovations. And, and we invest uh, solely in companies that, that have that purpose, and, and we don't believe that there is a, a conflict between purpose and profit, right? If you do right by your customers, be they consumers or small businesses, the economics will take care uh, of themselves. We've talked a lot about focusing on your customers and then the underlying infrastructure that's needed, that digital infrastructure to enable, I guess, the next wave of financial inclusion. I'd like to switch gears and focus a bit more on entrepreneurs um, and advice that you would give to sort of the next generation. The big theme of this event this year is around people and talent and, and resilience over the pandemic. Some of the best advice I've seen is from Tom Stafford, who's actually joining us later today. Um, but he said to his portfolio companies around, uh, think where you want to be post-pandemic. Pandemic. Um, think of the products you want to serve, the markets you want to be in, and then work backwards from there. Uh, Tillman, can you share some of the advice that you've given to your portfolio companies over this time? Yeah, that, that would be very similar, right? So obviously, in, in the March-April time frame, we, we advised everybody to step back, preserve cash, because there was so much uncertainty. Uh, and in particular, if, if you were in, a credit, in the credit business, you had to really pause, because you were underwriting on the basis of assumptions that had gone away. And before you go back um, uh, to extending credit, you need to understand what's going on. But relatively quickly, we realized what we talked about earlier, which is, wow, there's a real acceleration of the things we had been betting on anyhow. And so we advised our entrepreneurs to indeed think about where could they be long-term and work backwards from there and it has, it has worked very well for them. So the second half of the year in FinTech, where we largely invest, has been, has been very busy. And, and, and it continues to be. There's literally deal announcement, announcement by the day. And it will continue right until the year end break, is my sense. Yeah, I'm very happy to hear that Singapore has actually surpassed already its investment figures for last year in terms of fintech investment. So for I'm Q3, not yeah. um, I think it's 1.2 billion um, in, in Singapore, which is great to see both an equity and M&A deal. So it shows the strength of the, the ecosystem here. Eduardo, you know personally the, the successes of entrepreneurship, but I guess perhaps also the dark side, right? That as Facebook has got bigger and has this immeasurable power and perhaps dangerous power, uh, what advice would you give to new entrepreneurs that are starting out that, you know, at that point you're not thinking about the end, um, what the end outcome could be? How do you factor that in early, in the early stages? Absolutely. It's, it's something we think about all the time. And, you know, you know, part of the reason when we're having discussions with, you know, incredible founders and founding teams that are trying to build and create impact in the world is, is ultimately entrepreneurship is a, an incredibly uh, optimistic endeavor. Uh, by design and to the core, an entrepreneur has to be optimistic given the traditional challenges that, that come to bear in front of them. And, and that does lead one to sometimes uh, uh, not, not understand or, or, or 
or, or, or think too far in advance as to some of the potential negative, more pessimistic possibilities of where technology could, could take you. So it's very important uh, for, for entrepreneurs, and we talk about this all the time, to take a step back on the unbridled optimism and think about uh, what are you doing here for good? And are there any unintended consequences of what you're building? And how can we align the success of your business, sustainability, you being good to your shareholders and investors and consumers with broader uh, societal good? Um, and in some ways, it, it takes an entrepreneur and, and an investor as well to, to, to take a startup despite its incredible challenges that come to bear of what could they be even if they became massively big and became sort of world dominating? Um, but I think it's important from entrepreneur to entrepreneur, venture capitalist to venture capitalist, consumer to consumer, for all of us to ingrain in, in, in companies and their leadership teams that this it's important for you to understand that what you do is good. And, and hopefully, I do believe that the alignment of profit and success to to doing something that is a positive impact to the world is, is one of the ways to also drive sustainability to that message. That's a beautiful message. Thanks, Eduardo. Subra, not only were you the first investor in Zoom, I think Eric was actually your intern when he first came over to the US um, back at WebEx, if I'm not wrong. Um, and if you were to think about your interns now um, at Moxtra, what advice would you be giving them that could be the next, you know, the next unicorn? <laughs> Well, I think it's time of great change, a great cultural change, right? And as people have said, uh, it has turned out to be, for, for people, we are fortunate to be in a position to be able to participate and help and help architect the future. Uh, and we are at the particular play where humans, uh, as a broad sense, uh, get engage uh, in the economy uh, and the whole world of collaboration, right? And uh, so I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for people at this time to be engaged, uh, to think out of the box, because a lot of the uh, old paradigms on how, you know, some of the old business models which have built uh, a lot on uh, old behavioral patterns, right? On how, you know, you engage with your customers, right? How do you, I mean, you keep, you know, the old push model, pushing things all the time to your customers has to be changed and the whole perspective has to change where you, allow your customers to do, sort of pull uh, services from you on demand, right? These are like fundamental changes that are happening. And um, it's a great time to rethink uh, how or reimagine uh, existing business models uh, in, 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 and participate. Uh, and I think the this pandemic has also taught the world that we are all connected, right? Geographical boundaries, uh, without even the geographical bound. I mean, the, you know, the kind of uh, situation, don't know a political boundary, so to speak. So that perspective uh, should be a great unifier uh, for people to think out of the box in developing the next uh, generation of solutions. You talked a lot about old models there, Subra. You've had a lot of, uh, of success in your career to date, and yet you're back at it um, with your next startup. Well, I'm actually, even though I'm a CEO, I'm much more a grandfather CEO now because I, <laughs> I'm the mentor to the next place. Yeah, yeah, you know, as with Eric, I mean, he went off and he did fantastic, and I hope that will happen here. So these are sort of, you know, I found myself more comfortable in working with a few entrepreneurs than, let's say, many, and that's just uh, my preference. Yeah. And you're going to keep going? When does it end? Oh, this is, you know, it's like uh, I keep saying, you know, just, you know, people, I liken my work to writing a book or making a movie. You don't stop making movies. You keep on producing movies. I'm a producer. Now I can afford to hire good directors, and you know, and pretty soon I'll be an executive producer. So uh, there's no, you know, there's a whole creative element to it, and especially if you can uh, work from wherever you are, uh, there's very little tax on my time. I'm doing all the things that I love to do. So uh, I hope it doesn't end. That's <laughs> a better way to say. It. <laughs> and I'd like to end, or I'd like to come towards the end of this, looking at some of those green shoot stories that are taking us into next year. So um, I mentioned earlier the investment figures for Singapore, which is certainly an, a, a green shoot story for this side of the world, that we're seeing valuations bounce back and we've seen a number of deals um, that show maturity, I guess, in the fintech ecosystem here. 
I'd love to ask each of you to share a, a green shoot story. It could be a portfolio company, um, an idea that you've heard of, or a, a personal journey, personal story um, that has kind of excited you or um, felt a, a positive moment around um, as we go into 2021. Um, Tillman, I'm going to pick on you first for your green shoot story, either personal or your portfolio companies. Yeah, I go with portfolio. So we have an investment in Bangladesh. It's a company called ShopUp. And, and they started by helping uh, small business people, often women entrepreneurs working from home. They help them with providing a web, web presence. And that means Facebook pretty much in, in Bangladesh. And that, that's what they did in, initially. And then they realized they had to help them also with the logistics and the cash on delivery. Um, and, uh, and then they realized, wow, we have all this information. And it's an example of what I tried to uh, say earlier around sort of this power of embedded finance. Then they realized we have all this information. We can actually help them get access to working capital that they would have never gotten otherwise, because these are very small businesses in the informal economy. Traditional banks would not have touched them. When the pandemic hit, was one of the few companies that was actually allowed to operate because of the logistics piece. They were an essential business. And they recovered very quickly, and they will go to, to great new heights because they were there for their customers in an hour of need. They add real value. And, uh, and, and as I said, when, when, when you do right by your customers and when you have fundamentally sound economics, the rest will take care of itself. So. Very optimistic that this type of story will repeat itself many times over. And the company name there, Shop Up in Bangladesh. Shop Up. Mm -hmm. Shop Up. Great. Subra, over to you next. Well, again, as I said, I'm not an investor in the traditional sense, but there are a lot of uh, stories around our customers, right? Uh, yeah, you know, we have um, you know, one particular group. Uh, which has an app for, uh, you know, children uh, who have disabilities and sort of want to, uh, you know, engage with their friends, uh, but they need to be monitored and they need to be sort of, you know, protected in that. And, uh, you know, and we were happy to say that they were able to provide an environment, a virtual environment, but with the sort of supervision of their parents. I mean, it's a company called Sruli, for example, right? and they have been hugely successful in doing that. There are similar examples, of course, in the fintech space. I mean, we have banks now being able to make a lot of loans. Um, you know, we have a bank from Australia, Bank of Queensland, for example. They help uh, uh, you know people relocating from the U.S. back to Australia do the complete loan process in two weeks, all you know online, and so in a way that you would have never been able to do, or would not even have been conceptualized doing prior to this. So they are, you know, as I said, so, the, so we're seeing a lot of uh, people thinking out of the box in, in terms of adopting new technologies to, uh, to do business across borders uh, and in real time. That's great to hear. And I, it sounds like there, Subra, in terms of Mokstra, the, the range of clients then is not just at the you know, private banking end, which is where maybe it started, but all the way through um, from that example that you just gave. Exactly. We started with banking. We started actually in private wealth in Citibank in India, and it's grown all over. But now, as I said, I mean, we have a nonprofit organization. We have a pet mover from Hawaii, you know, using it to provide high value services. So it is the blending of high touch uh, services uh, with technology. You know, that's where we sort of want, you know, where do you add that human element, just in time human element in the process is sort of where we play. Uh, and it's very efficient for people to do that, uh, you know, in a, in a manner that's very efficient for people, for businesses to be able to bring that to bear. High touch care for customers. Yes. High touch just in time. <laughs> so that's great. High touch just in time. Eduardo, just yes. in time, um, tell us your green shoot story for 2021. Absolutely. Of course, one thing I would say more broadly, what's incredible, and we keep seeing this evolve year over year, is, is, is how uh, diverse the entrepreneur set is, is becoming. Uh, I, I think there was sort of a mention around uh, innovation, you know, transcends borders, uh, you know, age groups, uh, demographics, and, and we're seeing entrepreneurs of all types coming into bear. But one company I will flag here is, 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 is a company we, we backed in India that is, uh, you know, playing in the financial enablement and inclusion category called Katabook. 
but they're doing it to a very different way. Uh, they're taking a incredibly sort of simple uh, day-to-day process that happens today. The small businesses in, in India, the Kirana stores, ultimately are one of the biggest drivers of credit in the region. They provide credit to each of their small consumers that they know well, and they used to record these on a piece of paper. They've simply enabled that process online and started creating two-way networks including both the shops, their suppliers, and then ultimately their consumers. And what I find incredible, is first, is the scale they got to very quickly with incredibly simple technology in UX. But what's important here is the type of data that this brings to bear to enable, through time, credit uh, to ma- massive swaths of the population. So I view them as a, an enabler longer term of financial inclusion. And what's incredible is India is, you know, clearly, I I believe most of the world is, driven by uh, the hard work of the small business owner and enabling them and even the credit they provide as being mini bankers to their end consumers is an incredible way to to create true impact in terms of financial inclusion to, uh, to the masses in a place like India. Tillman, we have just a bit of time left, so I'm going to let you um, share some closing comments just on what Eduardo has just shared, because I know you invest heavily, you look heavily at India. We had Bill Gates join us two days ago talking about the opportunities that India has in terms of fintech. Is there anything you would like to add to, to Eduardo's point? Well, what India has done, which is fantastic, it, it created this, what they call the India stack, right? So there's a unique biometric ID, a foundational ID, there's an agreement on that that can be used for EKYC purposes. There's the National Payment Corporation, which is an API based uh, uh, payment interface. So, in some sense, India and other emerging markets are leapfrogging the advanced economies in the West because they are not encumbered by legacy systems and structures. And, and that's frankly very, very exciting to us. And it enables the type of innovation that Eduardo is talking about. Thank you. Some positive news stories all around. Um, thanks so much to my panelists and thanks for everyone joining us all around the world. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Um, thanks for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Some nice stories coming up from the panel of investors and some really uh, hopeful insights uh, for their outlook for 2021, albeit set against a backdrop of challenges. So very hopeful indeed. Before we move on, a big thanks to Rebecca and her panel of investors for sharing their insights with us.